The word remorse is alien to me, and I've been like this for quite a long time. But I never felt like there was something wrong with me. There are always a few problems I struggle with, even though I am strategic and intelligent. I have a hard time finding out how to react appropriately to situations with people's confusing and emotion-driven clues. My name is Paul Matthew. I'm a well-respected attorney and a good neighbor. I've often heard from people that I have a very charming smile. Guess that must be the reason why people are attracted to me like moths to a flame. They would mostly refer to people like me as either aggressive or seductive. But I'm a married man. I have a beautiful wife and two sons. I love my family, but I tend to keep my distance from them as much as possible. It's not because I ever felt like something is wrong with me. Instead, I'm enticed by violence. Something is thrilling about it. But I want to keep hiding this side of me as much as possible. That is the very reason why I bury my head in work all the time. No one knows about it, but before my wife, there was this girl I was interested in. She was nice, shy, and everything. But the day we started dating, her behavior changed, and she became demanding. I started ignoring her because I knew what I would do if I met her. But she kept pestering me, challenging my patience time and time again. So one day, I finally asked her to meet me for coffee. The feeling I kept having about her, I knew people would refer to it as wrong or not okay, but I couldn't help it. As I was sitting there waiting for her, rage kept reaching my brain, and I was calm, so no one would be able to tell what was going on in my mind. As she entered, my mind suddenly filled with a purpose, and I was still feeling as calm as ever. I stared at her while blinking my eyes, the adrenaline started flowing in me, and the taste in my mouth felt metallic. She walked toward me, sat across from me, and started complaining while looking at the menu. The rage in me multiplied tenfold, the multiple images started to spring into my mind, catching me in a megalomaniac fantasy. Me reaching to her, wrapping my hands around her fragile neck, my nails digging deep into her throat, making the slight drops of blood leak through them, and her life slipping away slowly. I snapped back to reality as she waved her hands in front of my face and I became hyper aware of my surroundings. The place was filled with crowd, so there was no way that I'd be able to do any of the things I imagined here. An annoying couple was sitting beside the table next to mine, an old man with a girl half his age behind me, the waiter who kept roaming around taking orders and delivering them, and a group of girls sitting on the table left from us. As I was observing them with an equal focus on Ella sipping her coffee while looking at her phone, she looked up to me, making eye contact. As she noticed me being unfazed by the eye contact, she tilted the corner of her mouth and continued sipping her coffee. After finishing up the coffee, she got up annoyed and left the cafe while I was left to pay the bill. And when I was done, she was nowhere to be seen. I tried calling her but she did not answer any of my calls. As I was annoyed and going back to my apartment, I used an escalator that was closed for some reason. A man called out to me, whom I presumed was a metro worker, and asked if I was blind for not seeing the yellow sign. I looked around and there was a yellow sign, but he continued that he was pissed on people like me for never following the rules. I kept my silence and continued staring at him as he said I trespassed because the escalator was already closed and I had broken the law. His tone was ticking me off, and I continued staring at him, which I guess made him feel uneasy. So he changed his tone to a rather polite one and said, be careful next time not to trespass. He patiently kept looking at me for a mere few seconds, hoping to get a reaction or answer out of me, but then turned away by the lack of my reaction. He may have thought it was okay, but not for me. It wasn't. What I was feeling at that moment, most people might refer to as just snapped. And that was exactly the case for me. I stood there, watching calmly as he continued doing whatever he was, which I guess alarmed him as he sneaked a peek at me. 
My hyper-awareness could feel him going haywire, and the cold sweat forming on his forehead which was rather amusing to watch. After that, he started walking away from me, and I started following him with silent, yet steady footsteps. The way he was walking seemed like he would start running at any given moment, but he didn't. I was hoping for him to walk to a deserted hallway where I could find him alone and do whatever I wanted with him. As I followed him, I was feeling so focused on every action that he was making, I didn't realize when a smirk formed its way to my lips. But then he walked out of the building to the crowded area, making me feel even more annoyed. I didn't give up following him, instead I made our distance to the point where he would not be able to notice me anymore. As he was walking forward, continuously looking left and right with unease, thinking I was still following him, he went into a supermarket. I followed him there as well, but it didn't matter. I lost sight of him. I spent a few more minutes looking for him, but when I couldn't find him, I found an exit. I walked back to my apartment building thinking about how I failed twice today into teaching those people the lesson they deserved. As I was walking inside the apartment building, my gaze went to the elevator and a smile found its way onto my lips. As I climbed the stairs to my apartment, I thought there was no way I was going to let them go so easily, as I already knew where to find them. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. Zachary Latham and his neighbors, the Durham family, did not get along. They lived opposite each other on the Thornhill Road in Vineland, New Jersey, a town of about 60,000 located 40 miles south of Philadelphia. After being forced to live with his grandparents at the age of 16, the Durhams initially found Zach to be a boisterous but polite young man. But as the years went by, neither he nor the Durhams had a good word to say about one another, and ultimately, the mutual animosity came to a head because of Zach's erratic style of driving. William Durham, along with his wife Catherine, had accused their 18-year-old neighbor of reckless driving on more than one occasion, and what was intended to be a friendly word with the young man quickly soured into a confrontation. When first approached by Mr. and Mrs. Durham, instead of responding amicably to their concerns, Zach responded by pulling out his cell phone. He then spitefully accused Mrs. Durham of being a Karen and swore at an enraged Mr. Durham when he objected to his behavior. Any chance of a peaceful coexistence went straight out of the window when Zack told the couple he'd be posting the video online. And post it he did, with the video going on to be viewed more than 3 million times by TikTok users around the world. What followed was an escalating feud that was later described as a powder keg. The confrontations between Zack and the Durham family were bad enough beforehand, but the publicity Zack had garnered meant that complete strangers were pouring gasoline on an already blazing fire. Hundreds of comments on the TikTok video of the argument between Zack and the Durhams urged him to cut her tires, egg her house, or the ominously vague go after her. Apparently a few weeks after the recorded confrontation, Mr. and Miss Durham were minding their own business and getting on with some housework when Zack pulled up next to them in his car. Hey, hey Karen, he is reported to have cried out. We went viral, Karen. I made you famous. The exposure had a terrible effect on the Durham's mental health and were even recognized around their New Jersey hometown, much to their chagrin. They sought out an injunction against the video, but were told by the police that they could not sign a complaint against Mr. Latham since the courts were closed because of the coronavirus pandemic. Then... On May 4th of 2020, Mr. and Mrs. Durham returned home from some grocery shopping to discover that Zach Latham had deliberately swerved his pickup truck at their son, who was out in the street riding his bicycle. Mr. Durham was furious. Humiliating him and his wife with online videos was one thing, but to threaten his son's safety was another thing entirely. 
He marched out of his house, got into his truck, and parked it right behind Zack's own vehicle, blocking him into his own driveway. And on that occasion, it was Zack's wife who was filming the exchange when he walked out of his home to confront Mr. Durham. Both were absolutely livid as they demanded to know what Zack was thinking when he nearly hit their boy. But Zack was in no mood to talk. He told the couple that they had better back up because they were not going to like what's coming out, referring to something he had inside his house. When Mr. Durham got a little too close to Zack, he threw a punch. It missed, but it was enough to have the Durham's two teenage sons stepping in to try to defend their father. It was then that Zack grabbed a stun gun and knife from under the driver's seat of his truck, firing the taser at the two boys after swinging at them with the knife. Mr. Durham then grabbed Zack in a misguided attempt to disarm him, who was lithe and fast enough to shake the older man off before slashing his right arm with the knife. With Mr. Durham bleeding profusely from the knife wound, Zack attempted to retreat into his garage, but the red mist had descended on his older neighbor, with Mr. Durham following him into the garage, cursing up a storm and promising to kill him. A courtroom later heard that a brief but violent melee then ensued, one in which Durham was repeatedly shocked with a taser. Zack's young wife begged him to drop the knife, but despite her pleading, Zack plunged the tip of the knife into an area just below Mr. Durham's armpit, a stab wound which punctured his lung and caused it to fill with blood. The 51-year-old correctional officer died that night, with Zack being arrested at his grandparents' home just hours later. During his trial for murder, the prosecution was particularly interested in why Zack's wife had been so quick to pull out her phone to record the confrontation. And throughout hours of questioning and evidence examination, it was determined that Zack and his wife had frequently discussed the idea of recording another viral confrontation with the Durhams, one that would grow their already sizable TikTok following, and the one that could make them some money. In a phrase, the court established that Zack had manufactured the confrontation so he could become TikTok famous. If Latham was in fear for his or Sarah's safety, they both would have retreated inside, called police and stayed there, the prosecuting attorney stated. They did not because their intent was to lure the Durhams there, attack them and record it for TikTok. But Zachary's defense attorney painted a very different picture of the night's events, insisting that it was in fact his client that was the victim in the situation, given that the Durhams had ventured onto his property to instigate violence. A recording of his 911 call was played to the court, and this is what they heard. Yeah, I need the cops out here. There's blood all over the place. I just got assaulted and jumped. I got beat up really bad and I have blood all over me. They came with trucks, came on my property with guns, and then when I fought them off, they drove away. It was a strong argument, but one that paled in comparison to the prosecution's own, which was ironically fueled by Zack's own actions. Since his arrest, Zack wasted no opportunity to grow his TikTok following by talking about the incident and broadcast to his thousands of followers. In the videos, he professes his innocence and insists that the killing was nothing but self-defense, arguing that he was merely a young man defending the home of his grandparents from armed intruders. But there was a distinctly darker side to the videos too, as Zack seemed content to whip up a frenzy of malcontent to direct at the Durhams and their friends. Zack's followers have been alleged to have harassed the Durhams directly, even going so far as to post their address in one video's comments section. Zack posted so frequently that, in the end, a superior court judge approved an order prohibiting him from making public remarks about the case, essentially silencing him before any trial can begin. This is most definitely something that's going to be used against Zack in his upcoming murder trial. The prosecution could well argue that his obsession with social media popularity pushed him to create more and more drama with a family that simply couldn't take his behavior any longer. Zack has documented his harassment of the Durhams. He filmed himself pushing a regularly suburban family to their limits, and when they finally snapped, he had someone ready to film that too. It seems that Zack is a young man with a very troubling upbringing, which included a juvenile criminal history and a penchant for violence. Whether or not you believe that Zack was just defending himself, 
or that he manufactured the confrontation. He has most certainly used his notoriety to foster a larger TikTok following, and that is something that is going to reflect very badly on him during his trial. Some people will do anything to be famous, but whether or not Zack killed a father of two over something as fickle as fame is something only a jury can now decide. Hi, I'm Alicia. I turned to see the girl who was sitting in my next seat when I heard her voice. Candace, I replied, so she doesn't get embarrassed and went back to looking outside the window. I was thinking, since the two of us are sitting together and it's a long journey ahead of us, could you share any of your troubled life experiences with me? As she said that, I looked at her doubtfully. No, don't get me wrong. Here I see a such story on this app called Reddit. One could say it's my hobby. She understood the look on my face and gave a quick response. I don't think I have something to share, I said uninterested and continued looking out the window. Oh come on, everyone has something, and just by looking at you, I can tell you do have something, she insisted. Yes I do, but it disturbs me just thinking about it, so I can only imagine how you would feel upon hearing it. I gave the same uninterested response as I was sure I wasn't going to tell her anything. Don't worry, I've uploaded so many troubled stories on Reddit after listening that it doesn't bother me anymore. The way she said that was quite interesting that made me want to test what she just said by telling her about my risky experience as well, so I denied it. She continued persisting for more than half an hour, annoyingly repeating the same things and promising that she would not put my name on the story anywhere if I didn't want it, and I stared at her for a while trying to decide if I should tell her or not. But then I thought, sharing it won't be that bad. So I started telling my story. I once lived in a village that was situated near a remote area of Montana in high country, which was far away from many other populated areas. The reason I went to live there was because I was on the run after stealing highly confidential material from this company and my father's people were hunting me like crazy. Living there was the safest option for me at the time. So I chose what could save my life and started living there. Is your father like rich mafia or something? She asked, laughing, cutting me in the middle of my story. You can't say that, I replied softly. So, what did you steal and run from him? She asked again. You said one story. Now if you want to hear it, keep quiet, I said. She nodded her head in response and I continued. The people living in the village were similar to me, who had run away from something either their past or their present, and they were trying to live peacefully in the area. Despite the area surrounding the village being barren, the land of the village was quite fertile, so they had everything that could be necessary to fill the belly. It was just like living in the old times. I managed to stay there for 15 days and was planning to stay longer. But one night when I was taking my stroll, just like usual, three men of the village walked to me and started asking me questions. When I did not give a proper reply, they started to force themselves on me. I always carried a taser and a knife with me for self-defense, so I managed to incapacitate the two of them. But one can never be too careful, so I took out my knife and stabbed them to death. The area was a bit far from the village, so I didn't think I needed to hide the bodies since I had never seen anyone come around this area. Leaving them for scavenging animals, I headed back to the village. The same night, I heard a knock on the hut's door I was staying in, so I went ahead to open it. It was Terry, a woman whom I had been well associated with since the day I entered the village. She asked if she could enter, and when she came in, she told me that tonight she went near the remote area and found the dead bodies of the people who lived in the village. I tried to act as shocked as I could, but then she started asking me weird questions which seemed as if she was suspicious of me. You may have seen them too, right, since you're the only person who takes strolls in that area. So why didn't you inform others about it? She asked as she doubted me. If I say I didn't see them? I replied in a calm voice. I saw you going there around the same time those people went there, but only you came back, she said. So what are you trying to imply? I killed them? I looked into her eyes as I asked this. She turned back to leave, and I knew she'd go directly to others and inform them about me. 
Knowing that I was going to regret the choice that I had made at that very moment, I still acted on it. I walked toward her and incapacitated Terry by using the taser, and I stabbed her to death as well. I somehow managed to hide her body within the hut, but I knew people were going to find out sooner or later and they would kill me. Thinking that I had no other choice, I decided to do something terrible. I was well aware of the fact that everyone was asleep, so I went where they stored and grabbed the gasoline cans. Then I went around the village and put it everywhere, since there were only about 10 to 15 huts. It wasn't all that hard to sneakily throw gasoline everywhere. When I was done, I set the village on fire, going out of there myself. As I was walking away from the places it burned, I could hear all the screams that were coming from in there. After walking non-stop, I finally came across a store from where I stole a pair of clean clothes and some money to travel, and then I got on the bus that could lead me to the city where my dear father is. You deliberately set fire to kill people? After hearing the story, Alicia looked at me with wide and terrified eyes and asked, the fluttering expression in her eyes could tell that she was deciding whether to believe me or not. You're the one who wanted to hear some story, so I gave you the story, I said calmly, and turned my head to the window and started looking outside. You're not making it up, are you? And why are you going back to your father? She asked with her voice breaking and trembling. To kill him, of course, I replied, as I continued to look outside the window of the bus I was in. So, this started about three years ago, when I was 18. I was using Tinder when some usual rando texted me and we started talking. The usual, what are you doing, what are you up to, etc. Then the rando started to sound depressed about how everyone hated him and occasionally talking about how he should end it all. Me being the nice person that I am, I try to find something about him that I could compliment and try to make him feel better. That sort of thing, or bring a smile to at the very least. And that's when things began to become heavy. Rando began to lash his anger, telling me that I'm a liar or a user and that I just wanted to make fun of him and I tried to reassure him that my compliment was genuine. I tried to tell him that I hate to see people down and depressed and like to make them happy because it wasn't my usual nature. Now I had been in his shoes before with severe insecurities, so I know how he felt. After he finally began to feel that my compliments were real, he started to get really attached to me and started berating me with messages. He would send me like 20 messages in one go, and if I didn't reply in 5 seconds he would be like, oh, I guess you find someone better to talk to. You get the rest. It began to get frustrating. And I could have just blocked him to relieve my headache, but I have anxiety and, and fear that he would turn up at my doorstep and do something drastic if I blocked him. He also started sending me nudes to grab my attention, to reply instantly to his messages, and it got worse and worse from here. Eventually, he told me that he would be in my town soon, and talked about meeting somewhere sometime and, and doing something. I didn't reply and he flipped out and started tapping all of my social accounts, Facebook messages, friend requests, Instagram follows. One night I went out with some of my friends for a night out and I forgot that he was in town for the weekend. He saw me walking down the street and came up to me and bawled his eyes out for not replying to him and begged me for my phone number and address and whether he could join us on our night out. And we politely refused. He followed us further and tried forcing drugs into my hand when we got to the bar. Infuriated at how clingy he was, I decided to go back home only to realize that he boarded the same bus as me and vanished only after he saw the place where I lived. He started texting me on Tinder how he would find me one day and find my friends to get my phone number. This was it, and I finally blocked him. And I thought I was done with it. This whole experience had really put me off dating people who have high insecurities only out of fear that this experience would be repeated. But something like this would happen again. I have been trying to stop over complimenting people too much out of the fear that this experience would happen again. It has been three years and I haven't seen him since. <laughs> <laughs> 